Hello BBK49, welcome to this week's lecture. My name is Pavri and today we will be talking about the basics of data acquisition. So there are three things that I hope you will take away from this lecture today. We will talk about how we can make measurements from the real world. Then we will talk about the principles that govern how we make these measurements and what characteristics those measurements have. So data acquisition is the process of taking a physical phenomenon, like the sound of my voice, blood pressure, and converting it to a digital signal that we can use to quantify the physical phenomenon we measured. Then we can take that digital signal and analyze it or even plot it to visualize the data. We can also create a signal rather than measuring a signal. This means we can go in the reverse direction of this graph. The software would be used to create the signal and then an actuator would be used to create the physical phenomenon. We can, so in this way we can measure sound with the sensor, but then we can also create sound with an actuator. In this course, we're gonna be focusing on this diagram where we will be measuring the physical phenomenon from the human body and then trying to interpret the data through software. So one thing that sensors and actuaries have in common is that they are both transducers. So a transducer is a device that converts input, the input energy of one form uh, into the output energy of another form. So sensors and actuators are both transducers, but they're just the reverse of each other. Uh, interesting fact, Steve Jobs actually changed the transducers in the speakers around his house so that he could use them as microphones. And he basically spied on his family without um, them knowing. And so um, leaving that aside, the sensor is then the component that converts the physical phenomenon into a signal, which we can then bring into the hardware that we're using. Some examples of sensors include accelerometers, which we're gonna be using in this course, thermometers, strain gauges, and microphones. Um, one thing that is important to know is that sensors don't always measure the things we think they are measuring. For example, a strain gauge is used to measure force, but it's not actually measuring the force being applied. It's actually measuring the change or the strain of the gauge, like the change in the shape of the gauge. And then another example is a therm thermometer. So it's not actually measuring the temperature, but it's measuring the change in the volume of mercury. In this way, um, sensors often indirectly measure what we want them to measure. So it's important that when we have our sensors, we are proper, properly calibrating them so that they can accurately measure what we want them to measure. With the thermometer example, um, we would need to calibrate it so that we know exactly how much a change in mercury volume corresponds to a change in temperature. So moving on to the next slide, um, we're just gonna come back to this diagram every so often just so we can um, keep track of things. In our lab, the sensor will be an accelerometer. So first we're gonna use the sensor or the transducer, transducer to go from the physical phenomenon into an electrical signal. So the electrical signal is often in voltage. And then we might decide we need to alter the signal in some way before sending it to the acquisition hardware or the hardware that's gonna store our signal. And so this step is called signal conditioning. And a lot of times we want to change the signal or we need to change the signal to be able to use it later on for analysis. One of the main reasons we condition a signal is to remove noise. So noise is any unwanted signal that doesn't really measure what we are intending to measure. Noise can come from different sources. So internal noise is noise that comes from inside the equipment. An external noise is noise that comes from the external environment. External noise is much more common. And noise that we can get from lights and electrical equipment is 60 hertz noise that comes from incandescent light or 100 hertz noise that comes from fluorescent light. So that's an example of some noise that um, you could encounter. 
And during the ECG lab, we're actually gonna learn how to filter out 60 Hertz noise. Um, and this is because if your computer is plugged into a power plug in your house, in North America, the AC power lines have a standard cycle frequency of 60 Hertz. So if your computer is plugged in while you're collecting data, you might actually introduce 60 Hertz noise uh, that is coming from the power source. So it's a good idea to understand where the noise is coming from and then how uh, you can then remove that noise. So there are uh, two ways that we can remove noise through signal conditioning. One way is to amplify the signal before the signal moves to the acquisition hardware. So if you have a signal that's of low magnitude and then you introduce some noise, and that signal then becomes obscured once uh, it passes through the wires. However, if the magnitude of your signal is much bigger than the noise that it could possibly introduce when it goes through the wire, then the signal isn't obscured as much. Uh, the other way of removing noise is by filtering the signal. So to remove unwanted high frequency noise, you would use a low pass filter. So what this does is it allows the low frequencies to pass through while removing and frequencies that are higher than that filter that you've placed. So if we had high frequency noise here and we used a low pass filter, the signal would then come out like this. Then the opposite is if you used a high pass filter where we want to filter out the low frequency noise. So here we are removing the low frequency noise and then leaving the high frequency signal to pass through. Uh, there's also something called a bandpass filter, which it doesn't only remove high or low frequencies, but it can remove both. So then the signal that you have in the end is in the middle of that high and low freq frequency filters that you've put. For us, we might uh, encounter high frequency noise due to the AC power, like I mentioned before, the 60 Hertz noise. And so then we might use a low pass filter um, for that noise. And then we might get some low frequency noise from things like cable movements. And then we might decide we want to use a high pass filter for that. So um, signal conditioning can happen in many different stages of the data acquisition process. So some sensors can do signal conditioning and uh, this might occur even before the signal moves through the wire. For our lab, the microcontroller and the accelerometer can both be involved in this process. And we might also do it later on in the data analysis stage. So it's really important to understand that there's not just one device that can do signal conditioning, but there can be many. And then this can also happen at many different stages of the diagnosis process. So once we have moved past this stage, next is the data acquisition stage. So here, um, here the electrical signal must then be converted to a language that the computer can understand so that once we move from the sensor to the computer, it can actually be stored in the computer. And that is done by the data acquisition hardware. So up until this point, when we we're talking about a signal, we are talking about an analog signal. So an analog signal is continuous in time and space. In order to store the data in a computer, the data has to be digitized. This means it's discrete in time and space. So some sensors already give us a digital signal. For example, some accelerometers, um, they don't give us a voltage or electrical activity, but they actually give us the G forces that were being measured. But not all sensors do this. So before we can analyze a signal, we might have to convert it from analog to digital. Take, for example, a record player. So as an example of analog versus digital, we have the record player versus a CD. So a vinyl record only has two grooves, one on each side of the record. 
And then a record player can create an analog signal because that groove is continuous. So sound comes from the record player when the needle moves through the hills and the valleys and the groove of the vinyl. And then it's then transmitted to a diaphragm which vibrates and emits the noise. If we wanted to play a song from that was, let's say the record player was playing a song. And if we wanted to play that same song from our computer, we'd have to digitize the, uh, we would need a digital version of the vinyl record. So we have to translate those hills and valleys of that groove into a digital signal. If we collect the signal with a high, high enough resolution and sampling frequency, our ears won't be able to tell the difference between the record and the computer. And I'll get a little bit more into this um, in the next couple slides about resolution and sampling frequency. But so um, digitization is the conversion of continuous analog data that's from the real world into discrete digital values through sampling and quantization. So what we want to do is we want to go from this analog signal, which is blue, this continuous signal, um, into something that's more like these red dots where they are discrete but still following the pattern of the original signal very similarly. So to digitize the signal, we have to take a snapshot of the signal at a distinct time period. So this is called sampling. In this example here, we're taking a sample of the signal every single second. So after one second, we take another sample, another sample, and another sample. So each discrete value um, or discrete point is then happening every second. And so we can see that sampling is then able to divide the x-axis into discrete intervals. Now, we also need to know the amplitude of the signal at each time point. So through quantization, we can divide the y-axis of the signal into discrete values. And then uh, the, when we are sampling the data, the system just chooses the closest discrete value to the signal at that point. So you can see that the y-axis is split into uh, discrete values that increase or decrease by 0.2 volts. If we look at the graph, we can see that um, the system has chosen points that are as close as possible to the real signal, but not exactly. It has to follow these discrete values. So it can only increase or decrease um, by multiples of 0 0.2, right? So you can see that this dot, it is very close to the signal, but it might not be exactly where the signal is. So two other terms that we're going to need to know are sampling frequency and resolution. So sampling frequency is one over the time between samples. So in this example, um, each sample is one second apart. So that would be one over one, which means our sampling frequency is one Hertz. So the units for sampling frequency is in Hertz. Now resolution is the minimum difference between discrete amplitude. So for us, that's 0 0.2 volts because that's the minimum difference between points. So like I mentioned with the record player, um, if we have a high enough resolution and a high enough sampling frequency, the digital signal then becomes closer to the analog signal and my ears won't really detect much of a difference between the record and the, uh, the CD. So with sampling and quantization, we have our discrete values, but we also need to store these values. So computers store values a little bit differently than how us humans would normally think of numbers. When we write down numbers, we use a 10 base system. And this system only uses values from zero to nine, where zero is the first number and one is the next number, then two and so on until we get to nine. So this is basically the decimal system. If we take the number 42, for example, um, that 
consists of four tens, right? 40, four times 10. 10 is also 10 to the power of one. Remember our base is 10. And then it's also, um, we need two ones, which is 10 to the power of zero. So in this way, we can then um, write down 42 like so, using the 10 base system. Computers are a little bit different. So computers store information using a binary system with a base of two. So instead of adding um, through 10 to the power of a number, we add uh, then we add up to the number using two to the power of numbers. So two is our base. And this system only uses two different values. So we use zeros and ones instead of zero to nine. So if we look at the example of 42 again, but in the binary system, which is how computers will store the information, um, we're gonna start from the left again. The highest possible value that we can include without going over 42 uh, in this system, in the two-base system, is 32. So remember, uh, 32 is the same thing as saying two to the power of five. So we would put a one here to show, okay, we're gonna include, we need 32. If we look at the next possible number we can use, um, we can't include 16 because uh, 32 plus 16 would surpass 42. So we're gonna put a zero there because this is not something we're going to need. Then we go to the next number and um, we can use eight because 32 plus eight is 40, which is lower than 42. So we add a one here. Then we probably won't add a four because remember 32 plus eight plus four, that's gonna be 44. So we're gonna to go to the next number which is two, also two to the power of one, and we're gonna add a one here. So to be able to write down 42 in binary, we would have to write it down as one zero, one zero, one zero. So this is the same, so we need at least six digits, right? Or six bits. And one bit is just one binary digit, so a zero or a one. It's like how when we have the decimal system, if we say 42, then we're gonna say that's two digits. Here we have six digits. So a bit is the smallest unit of storage that a computer can have. So the more bits that a computer is using, the more bits or values that we can actually store as well. I'm just gonna put my right here. Okay, so now let's combine what we know. We know that quantization is when we divide the amplitude into evenly spaced discrete values. We also know that the number of bits that the hardware has dictates how many chunks the y-axis is broken into because that's how many discrete values we can have. So let's take a look at this example. Uh, the y-axis is going from zero to seven. So that means there's going to be eight discrete values that are possible or that the signal could have. This means that this converter had um, three bits. Remember two to the power of three is equal to eight. So this curved line here is the real signal, right? The analog signal. And if we look at this, point on the graph, you can see that when we try to quantize the value at 0 0.5 seconds, um, it doesn't go exactly to where it would be on the analog signal. It goes to the closest discrete value, and that would be 3 on this graph. So if you wanted to digitize the value 3, that means converting it to binary for the computer, we can do that um, by writing zero, one, one. So remember two to the power of one is two plus two to the power of zero is equal to one. So two plus one gives us three. And that's how we would write it down in binary for the computer to store. 
Another important variable that we have to consider is the input range. So it's very important that the input range is appropriate for the signal we're trying to measure. If the input range is too wide, uh, many of the possible y-axis values are wasted because the signal doesn't approach those values. So this reduces the resolution of the signal and leads to greater quantization errors, errors where um, the accuracy of the signal conversion is lower. If the input range is not wide enough, then the signal can become cut off. For example, if we have an accelerometer that measures 10 volts, but the hardware only measures five volts, we can lose a lot of data. This is called clipping. So if we take this example for uh, this graph, for example, um, here the input range is plus minus 40 volts. And we can see that the signal exceeds that input range and it ends up being clipped. So the red is what we would um, be collecting but the gray is the actual signal. So you can see that the signal, uh, we're losing a lot of data. You can think of the input range as like taking a picture. So on one hand, you don't want to zoom in super close to somebody's face because you might cut off parts of their face. So that could be if the input range is too narrow. On the other hand, you don't want to be super, super, super far away because um, you can't really make out the features of the face, the face gets pixelated. So then that becomes a waste of resolution and it would be if the input range is too wide. So the last few slides, we talked about setting the range and the magnitude of the signal. So setting the y-axis characteristics. And now we're gonna talk about the sampling frequency which can determine the x-axis characteristics. So the sampling frequency needs to be high enough that we don't lose important characteristics of the data. Um, it's a good thing to have a high sampling frequency, but sometimes it's not also possible. Um, if you have a really, really high sampling frequency, then you also have a lot more data points to store. So sometimes you're limited by your storage capacity or the speed of the equipment. So you can't sample too much. So you have to find a sampling frequency that's kind of the sweet spot where you get enough data points that um, it represents the signal, but not too much that you're overloading your storage. So the Nyquist theorem says that the sampling rate must be equal to or greater than twice the highest frequency component in the analog signal. So if we drop below the Nyquist frequency, we run into aliasing. So aliasing results in a signal that does not represent the true signal. If we take a look at this graph, the black line is the true signal. It's what we want to measure. The red dots show what the signal would look like if we sample below the Nyquist frequency. So as you can see, uh, the red dots show a completely different pattern than what actually happened. And so the Nyquist theorem is very helpful in these situations because it can give you a sampling frequency that is high enough that aliasing doesn't occur. If you want a real world example of aliasing, uh, think of when you look at a fan that's spinning really fast or a, a plane propeller. Uh, sometimes when you look at it, it looks like it's spinning backwards, even though it's not. And this is an, exa an example of aliasing where the human eye can't sample fast enough that sometimes to capture enough, um, sometimes we end up seeing something that's different than it was. So the human eye can't capture enough data and then it looks like the propeller is spinning backwards. Um, this is actually called the wagon wheel effect. So if it's something that interests you, you can look that up. Coming back to this diagram again, we have the acquisition hardware, which digitized the signal, which means we're going to sample and quantize the analog signal so we can make it a discrete signal. And then we're going to store um, the signal in a binary language. In our case, the microcontroller is our acquisition hardware. 
Once we've gotten all the data, we can upload it to the computer or maybe it's already stored in the computer and then we can analyze it using a specific software. So in our lab, we're gonna be using Python to analyze the data. Uh, like I mentioned before, signal conditioning is done in multiple stages in the data acquisition process. So one way to do signal conditioning was to filter the data. Usually after collecting the data, um, the signal is still quite noisy. So in our labs, we will almost always filter the data um, so that uh, we will almost always filter the data later on using Python. And then Python is also really helpful in visualizing the data where we might plot it so that we can understand what's happening better. Okay, so finally, we're gonna wrap up the presentation by talking about data acquisition in the human body. So we're just gonna go through this whole diagram as if, um, but use the human body as an example. So let's say there's a sound that we want to try to process. The sensor in this case would be our ear. Our ear takes sound waves, converts them to vibrations, and then ultimately converts that into an electrical signal. So the ear is the sensor, but it's also the acquisition hardware because it's making the signal understandable for the computer, in this case, our brain, right? We are converting from sound to electrical signals. Our ear also has an input range. So we can only hear sounds within a certain range. Anything above or below that, we can no longer hear. And once we have digitized the signal, in this case, converting it to an electrical signal, um, our synapses and the connections in our brain can be thought of as the software. So they are the software that's gonna analyze the signal and process it. And then in the end, we uh, can analyze the signal and we can perceive the sound that we heard. If we go in the reverse direction, we may want to actually create a sound rather than try to process it or listen to it. So our synapses or the software can then prepare a signal in our brain, which then creates a muscle contraction and to expel air from our lungs. So then as the air moves up through our voice box, it vibrates and then we can create a sound. So the actuator then becomes our muscles and our uh, voice box and the physical phenomenon becomes the sound. So with this example, we've gone forwards through the data acquisition process as well as backwards. That concludes the presentation today. So I'm hoping this was very helpful in understanding the role that our equipment's gonna be playing in this data acquisition process. And in the following weeks, we'll be going more into the equipment learning how to process and visualize the data and uh, being able to do some really cool stuff with this equipment. So I will see you all in lab and goodbye.